Like I said, this is going to be a little bit different of a, of a uh, time. Than, than we're accustomed to. <clears throat> I will tell you this, and I'll tell you again here as we get into the message. If you have a notepad, now will be a time to go ahead and get it out. Okay? Um, I'm going to give you tons of scripture tonight. We're not going to have time to go to all of it. Um, so write it down. It'll be good to go back. And I'm not going to completely milk this uh, topic tonight. Um, we're, we're going to hit it kind of in overpassing, and, um, but I believe it will be profitable to you. Do, does anybody need a notebook? If you need a notebook, I'll send JB back there to the back and get one of our uh, Hope Bible Baptist notebooks. And uh, that way you can make, take some notes, things of that nature. Pull a scrap piece of paper out. This will be profitable for you, I do believe, um, as we look at this uh, topic tonight. Uh, Exodus chapter number 25. Let's stand together. Exodus 25 and verse number 10 is where we'll start our reading. <clears throat> Read down through verse number 22. We were on this topic uh, some time back whenever we uh, preached, were preaching through the furniture. And as we come to finishing up here this evening, I wanted to hit it one more time and just kind of give an overview of this, this piece of furniture and its journeys. Okay, So Exodus chapter 25 verse number 10, the Bible says, and they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half, a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within, the, within and without, shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about, and shalt cast <clears throat> four rings of gold for it, and put them in the corners thereof, four corners thereof, and... Two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings of the sides of the ark, uh, that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. Thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold and beaten uh, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat. And their wings and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. Thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee above, uh, from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. You can be seated in this evening. Now, you say, Pastor, we've already looked at the Ark of the Covenant, and you would be correct. We have some time back, several uh, weeks back, if you will, we, we were in this same scripture, and we started to look. But once again, I want to look here at this Ark um, that, that we covered in, in this series of the Tabernacle. I hope that through this series that we've learned something of the Tabernacle and the meanings of it. I tried to be as detailed as possible and still leave a little bit to go back and look at and still leave a little meat on the bone, so to speak, um, that if you did want to go back, that it wasn't milked completely out um, as we looked uh, through the tabernacle. So uh, like I said, to be as detailed as possible, but still leave it so you can go in and search some things out. This series has taken us from the tribes through the tent and showed us um, the, the different parallels for us today. And Brother Peter, and I find it to be interesting that whenever we're studying the tabernacle, we can see how it applies to us today and, and, and how it's set up and, and the, uh, the way that it applies into our lives. So I, I want to look tonight at just two points. Two points, and, and we'll be finished up prayerfully with, <clears throat> with the tabernacle. But I said, suggest, like I said earlier, that you check out a notepad, write these references down, because there's no way in the world that we'll be able to hit all of them and get this message done in ten messages, okay? There's going to be a lot of scripture that I give you tonight. There's going to be a lot that we talk about. I'm not going to preach each individual thing. As a matter of fact, there's going to be more informational as we finish up this, uh, this um, series. And I, I wanted it to be that way. I believe God would have it to be that way. 
way so we can finish up on an intellectual note and, and be able to see where we, we have come from concerning this, uh, this tabernacle, okay? So um, this evening, I want to take one final look at the Ark of the Covenant. I want to be able to glean as much as we can this evening from the scriptures, glean as much as we can about the journey that it took. We're going to look at the ark uh, from, from inception all the way to the last known uh, sayings of it in Jeremiah. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that here in just a few moments. So let's pray. Ask God to help us in this message and that we can, we can glean something from the scriptures this evening to leave this uh, series with. Uh, Brother Matt, how about you, you pray for us before we preach? Amen. Like I said, we have a lot to cover this evening, and so I want to jump right into this topic at hand that we've been tasked with for the final uh, message of this series. Uh, we come to the end of this series, and like I said, I want to cover just two points concerning this ark. Uh, through this series, we've seen the areas surrounding the tabernacle, um, as well as inside of the tabernacle. We've looked at the people around the tabernacle, and we've also looked at the purpose uh, uh, con surrounding the tabernacle. In the message this evening, I want to look at two things. First one is going to be the journey of the ark, and the last one is going to be Jesus and the ark. Okay, So we'll be able to look at, at, look at those two things this evening and prayerfully have you out of here before bedtime. So we'll look at the ark uh, uh, from, from the time that God told Moses to build it here in Exodus 25, told him to what, how to build it, what to do, all the way up concerning the ark, all the way over to Jeremiah is where we'll finish up this evening. Uh, so then we'll, we'll look at uh, the tabernacle surrounding uh, the, uh, the tabernacle rather and the setup around the ark and the foretelling of Christ and I think it's just a beautiful beautiful picture so let's start here the journey of the ark of the covenant we looked here in chapter 25 all right, here in chapter 25, we see that God's telling Moses all the particulars. This is what you need to do. Build it this way. Build it that way. Overlay it with this. And you're going to put a stave in there, and these staves will stay there. It's not going to be like on the altar of incense. It's not going to be like on these other items that you can remove the staves. These staves stay in place because no one's going to touch this ark. You're going to carry it by the staves. So we saw that, and we talked about that a few weeks ago. Then over in Exodus chapter number 20, 26 and verses 31 through 33 and you don't need to roll over there. I'm going to kind of give you what each one of these are, but did want to give you the uh, references that you can go back and look. So in Exodus chapter 26 verses 31 through 33, we found the veil. The veil was being woven to be placed in the separation of the holy place and the most holies. That's what the purpose of that veil was. We talked about that because nobody could go into that most holy place to where the ark was because the ark contained the very presence of God and nobody could go in there but the high priest, right? So the veil was constructed there in Exodus chapter 26, verse 31, 33. The particulars were given. Then the Lord spoke spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter 40 and verses 1 through 4 and he told him in Exodus 40 verses 1 through 4 he told Moses that on the first day of the first month you are to set up the tabernacle and when he was to set up the tabernacle he was to place the ark into the most holy and cover it with that veil then following that, you would find in verses 5 through 21, uh, God goes through and tells them how to set up the rest of the furniture around the tabernacle, how the tabernacle should be set up. We've covered all that stuff. I just want to give it to you that you've got references that you can go back and look at. There are several references to the time that the tabernacle was carried around in the wilderness. Okay, uh, Write these down. I'll give you about five. Um, Leviticus chapter 16. Numbers chapter 4, chapter 10, and chapter 14, and also Deuteronomy chapter number 10. We find that in our study, uh, we, we've seen, Brother Matt, that the ark was used for the worship of God, for the atonement of sin, right? This was the most important thing, Brother Mike Brown, 
to the children of Israel. They would not go anywhere without this. So from the time that it was uh, the inception of this uh, ark, the inception of the tabernacle, it stayed with them no matter where they went. Every time they traveled, they packed it up and they took off. They got where they were going and they set it up as soon as they got there. It was that important to them. So we understand in those one, two, three, four, five references that I gave you that the talks about how important the tabernacle was to them, Brother Peter, we understand that they didn't go anywhere without it, right? We, we don't find that a lot in Christianity today. Um, <clears throat> that, that people, you talk to people who are moving, and um, I, I love the other day, and all y'all know, I'm not not puffing them up. Everybody knows Tzolotovich's uh, testimony of how they got to Maine. One of the first things they did was, we're going to find a church to go to. It's not God's will that I move there. And I love that. I love yeah. that. Um, because that's something you just don't find today. You just don't find that day people are like, oh, I got a promotion. I got an opportunity to move here. I want to do this. I'm going to go over there and move over there. I'll find a church when I get there. No. You need to make sure that you got a church before you move and do anything, right? And that's the way the children of Israel were. They said, hey, no matter where we go, we're taking God with us and we're going to set up a, 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 a tabernacle right there wherever we are. So I praise the Lord for, for their, their faith and their, uh, their desire to serve God. Go with me to Joshua chapter number 3. Joshua chapter number 3. We find in Joshua chapter number 3, we'll look at verse 7, but we find that the Lord had given Joshua a promise. Given him a promise just as he gave Moses a promise. He says over here in verse number 7. Verse number 7, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses so I will be with thee. So God said, I'll magnify you and the people will see it. Now, why, would, why did God say that he would do that? Because of Joshua's faithfulness, right? Remember we preached on the ten and the two, right? Yes. Because of his faithfulness, because of his desire to do what God would tell him to do and his desire to keep the tabernacle up and running, right? So that he would bless them and he would magnify them in the sight. Look what he says in verse number 8. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither. And hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Follow the ark... And you are following the Lord. The principle here that is given to the children of Israel. If you follow this ark, he's going to give you victory over the Jebusites, the Gergesites, the uh, Amorites, and all those different lists, six, seven, eight people that he just listed out. He says, follow the ark because the ark is the presence of God is where he would meet with his children. And Brother Mike, if we will keep our focus, the principle he's given us here in Joshua, if we'll keep our focus on that ark being the presence of God, if we'll keep our focus on the presence of God, Brother Tom, then he'll bring us through whatever we may be facing. Right. He'll take us through all those different things. Follow the ark and follow the Lord. If you follow God, you have no fear. Wow. Right? He will not be defeated and He will bring you through the other side. Hallelujah. His promise is revealed in verse number 17. Even though, if you'll read through those verses, we, didn't, we, we skipped over verses uh, 12 through 16 there, you'll find out that the, river, the, the, the waters of the river Jordan was flowing over the sides. I mean, it was just, it was coming down and, and the water was moving and, and it, was, it was up over the sides of the river. And in verse 17, we find out that he says, and the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed 
clean over Jordan. He brought them all over as they followed the ark. Right? They, the, the Jordan was flowing pretty steady at that time. So much so, Brother Mike, that if you look back in Scripture, it was up over the sides of the banks. But yet, when they carried the ark, not only those priests that toted the ark, but all the people passed through behind. Why? Because they were following God. They were following what God had told them to do. This set us up for uh, chapter number 4 in the book of Joshua that the people built an altar to God that they could pray and they could always remember what was done. Roll over to chapter 4 and look in verse number 6. That they could always remember what the Lord had done for them. In Joshua chapter number 4 and verse number 6, the Bible says this, that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Forever, he said. He said, let this be a sign unto them that we follow God. And he brought us through. Let this be a sign where we are tonight to this community yeah. that we follow God. And God has brought us through. And God is going to continue bringing us through. Set up those stones in our lives. This is, this is a pillar of those stones, this building. It, 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 it's just a place that houses the house of God when we're here. Amen? But that's what it is. But it is a, to this community, they see it as being a church. This is where God's children come to worship and meet with Him. This is a testimony, a memorial, if you will, of a group of people that decided to follow God. And that's what Josh was saying here in chapter number four. When we get across there, set up those stones because the ark, the presence of God, has gone across the river Jordan for us. And we followed him. Yeah. It's not saying set up stones to see how well we waded across the Jordan. Yeah. Set up those stones that we can look and see what we did. No. Set up those stones as a memorial for what God's done in our lives. Mm -hmm. By us following him. Amen. He brought them over. Because they followed the ark. Let me ask you a question this evening. How many rock piles, altars of prayer, do we have that we can go back to that remind us of God's faithfulness to us as we were faithful to him? Because that's what those rock piles were for. Brother Mike McPhail they set those up because God had been faithful to them to bring them across. But the only reason God was faithful to them was because they were faithful to Him. How many altars, how many rock altars do we have that we can take our children back to? Our grandbabies back to? And say, this right here, what meaneth these stones, Peppa? Let me tell you what God did in my life through this. What being of all these different things? I, I'm, I, I can't wait to be able to give some of my grandbabies, maybe whenever I'm Mike Brown's age, 130, that I can give them some of my old Bibles and they can read them and they can look back and they can look and say, Hey, Peppa, what, 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 what were you going through right here? You wrote a, little, wrote a little note in your Bible right here. And I can say, Oh, what meaneth that stone, child? Let me tell you about what God did for me right there i got things going in my mind right now. I can just, I just can't wait. But what meaneth those? We ought to have some pillars set up somewhere. I'm not talking about a physical rocks. I do know people that have set up physical rocks outside of their churches and things of that nature as, as, a, as a testimony that God's brought them there. And God's brought them across the Jordan in, into the promised land. So, so, you know, I do know folks that have done it. I'm not talking about the physical. I'm, I'm talking about the things that we know of, those obstacles that we've gone over. And the only reason, Brother Mike Brown, we've gone over them, Brother Tom, is because God's brought us through it. 
Look over at Joshua chapter 6. Very familiar portion of Scripture. Some may not remember the ark being part of this. But the triumph there at Jericho. Some may not remember the ark being a part of it. And honestly, I can, I can be honest with you, it's not something that sticks out in the forefront of my mind that the Ark of the Covenant was there. Just no, what, what do we think about with, the, with the, the walls of Jericho? They march around, they march around, they march around six times, march around seven times on the seventh day. They yell, they blow their trumpets, and what happens? The walls come down, all except for Rahab's house, right? We don't really think about the Ark being there, but the Ark was there. Now, you may, in the back of your mind, know, yes, we know that it was there, but it's not something that sticks in the forefront of our mind. So here we're looking in Joshua chapter 6 and looking verse number 6. And Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priest and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets and of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. Now, if we were to continue our reading, we would see that on the first day, Joshua and the priest rose up early, they took up the ark, and they walked the walls, and then they went back to camp. On the second day, they did the same thing. Third, fourth, fifth, all the way through the sixth day, we find them walking around the walls, not saying anything up until that seventh day. Here they go out on their journey, seven days around the or seven times around the walls on that seventh day. And that seventh time, the horns blow. Joshua commanded them all to shout. They shout. The walls, the walls come crashing down, all except for Rahab's place that had that scarlet. Uh, Cora hanging out the window, praise the Lord. Uh, the, for, that's a beautiful picture of salvation, right? Yeah. Everything falls apart around you, but because of your faithfulness to God and that scarlet cord, uh, that you are saved. Amen? And, and he spared her life. We have another message for another day. But anyway, we see that they, the ark was there at the triumph over at, at the walls of Jericho, right? Joshua chapter number 8, the conquering of Ai. And the covenant being remembered there at Ebal. Now we see all the great victories that can be won, but what is the the what is the the common denominator, if you will, of everything going on in all those things that I told you about? What was there? The ark. The ark which is the presence of God. Right? We can get through any obstacle, Brother Tom, if we keep God at the center. Any battle that may be going, whether it be physical, whether it be mental, whether it be emotional, whether it be mental, whatever it may be, spiritual, whatever it is, God can bring us through that if we keep our focus on Him and Him in the center of things. They walked the ark around the walls of Jericho. They had the ark there at Ai. Great victories took place because of the different things. They stepped over Jordan because the ark went with them. They were, they, though they walked through uh, the wilderness for so long, the ark stayed with them. Who guided them through the wilderness? God did, right? Sometimes a cloud by day, right? Fire by night. Why was it a cloud by day? Because it gets hot. Right? Why was there a fire, pillar of fire at night? Not only easy to see, but it gets cold out in the desert at night. After it's been 110 degrees, 60 degrees is really, really cold. Right? So he kept them comfortable and he led them and he guided them. Why did he do that? Because they kept him in the center of their lives. You remember whenever we sat up here on the, uh, the, uh, the tabernacle, where did the tabernacle go? It didn't go on this end of the field and everybody else out this way, right? Where did it go? It went right in the center of all the people. So all the tribes gathered around. Why? Because that is the middle of their life, the middle of their lifestyle. So they kept God right there. So you see that in Joshua 8, the, the AI. We see that the presence of God uh, and all the victories that were won. Look with me in Judges. Judges chapter number 20. Judges chapter 20 and verse 27. This is different for me because I don't know that I've ever preached a message without points. I mean, I kind of gave you a little point there at the get-go, but it, not, not really points. 
So it's a little different for me, but like I said, I want it to be more educational, more something that you can go back and look at in days to come and you can see how everything comes along. So in Judges chapter 20 and verse number 27, And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow, I love this, I will deliver them into thine hand. Here we see that the children of Israel at war with the tribe of Benjamin, and Phinehas did what? He stood before the Lord, stood before the ark, which was before the Lord, and he told him that he would deliver them into his hand. Brother Mike Brown, once again, getting in the presence of God brings victory. This isn't just Old Testament, guys. This is for us today. This is for us today. Listen, I'm never going to get victory over anything I've got going on in my life, Brother Tom if I'm not going before God, asking That's Him to good. get rid of it for me. Right? I'm never going to grow in the Lord if I'm not willing to let Him mold me and shape me into the image of His Son. Right? <clears throat> this guy, Phinehas, went before the ark and God told him, as he come before him, I will deliver the tribe of Benjamin into your hand. This is just another opportunity that we see, Brother Peter, that God has brought someone through a victory, given them a victory, because they're willing to get in his presence. How many victories can we have, Brother Matt, if we would just use these two things right here? Now, you may not pray on your knees, and that's fine. You may not pray prostrate, and that's fine. You may walk around, and you may sit in a chair. You may kick back in a recliner. You may lay down in your bed. It doesn't matter. But how many victories are we missing out on, Brother Tom, because we're not willing to go into the presence of God and ask Him for these victories? If an Ahos walks in there, Brother Mike, and he says, Hey, should I just quit? Should I just, should I just stop? You know, what am I, should I just leave it? What should I do? He said, No, 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 no. Go. And I'll deliver them into your hand. That wouldn't have happened if he didn't talk to God. Because what was his first initial reaction? His initial reaction was, shall I cease? And God said, no, don't you dare quit. Child of God, don't you dare quit. Don't you dare quit. I've got far too much Bible. You've got far too much Bible to tell you that God will bring you through. We don't need to worry. Oh, I'm going to stop. Don't you dare quit. Because I promise you, Miss Robin, if we're ready to quit, victory's just one step ahead. Yeah. Oh, I just can't take it no more. How would you feel? How would you feel, Brother Matt, when you get to heaven and God say, you were two hours away from victory and you quit. You were 30 minutes away from victory and you quit. Could you imagine running a marathon, running to Boston? I can't. All right. Could you imagine running a Boston marathon? 26.2 miles. And you've got 26.1 miles down. And buddy, you're feeling good. And all of a sudden, you're just like, nah. Would anybody in here do that? I don't think anybody in here would run a marathon. Do, I mean, not for fun anyway. I mean, if somebody's chasing me, maybe. But I'm not just going to go out and do that, Miss Julia. <laughs> Who would do that? That's... Ugh. Matt, yeah, Matt. <laughs> Matt's like, no, 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 no. no. I'll, I'll lift weights and stuff like that, but I'm not running, right? Cardio does nothing for you. Hey, Amen. That's why I said bodily, bodily exercise profit if little. Isn't that what the Bible says? Hey, Amen. Yeah, and the wicked flee when nobody chases them, right? That's right. Hey, man. Boy, well, see, we can take scripture and make a mess, can't we? <laughs> Hey, man. No, take care of yourself. That's not what the Bible is saying. Take care of yourself, all right? <laughs> but anyway, it, you wouldn't get to finishing your race and just quit. How many people, I, I can't remember what it was, that they didn't know where the finish line was. Maybe it was climbing Everest or something like that. And they got to a point and they just couldn't go anymore. And they were like 100 yards from the summit but they turn around and come back down. Can you imagine how discouraged that person would have been when they got down and said, yeah, I saw old green boots up there. And they said, 
you, you were right around the corner from the top. You almost made it. How discouraged will we be when we get to heaven and we stopped here and the victory was right there. Think about, think about those folks there with Joshua looking there at the River Jordan and how high it was and you know, think, you know that, that it was just too much. We can't cross it. We can't do it. What would have happened if they just turned around? They'd have kept taking laps, wouldn't they? they'd have, no telling. They may have gone another 40, Brother Mike. I, I don't know. I can't tell you. But I do know this. They stayed with the stuff. And God blessed them. You in Judges 20? Verse 27? All right. Just as when the ark was taken here to Bethel in the midst of trying times, understand that our lives, no matter the mountain to climb, no matter the valley we may feel that we are in, if we stand before the Lord just here as Phinehas did, if we stand before the Lord and seek His wisdom and not our own for our problems, then He will deliver. He will deliver us. We find the ark making its journey through the book of First and Second Samuel. I'll give you these verses and the high points of them, and you can look them up later, okay? Just for sake of time. Uh, write these references down. 1 Samuel chapter number 1 and verse number 3. 1 Samuel chapter number 3 and verse number 3. So 1 Samuel 1, 3 and 3, 3. The Lord speaks to the child Samuel, who's asleep, uh, sleeping near the ark here at Shiloh. And then we roll over to chapter number, or, uh, chapter number 4, and we see that the Philistines take the ark. Everybody remember that, that account, right? The Philistines go and they take the ark, and, and they got it. And then but we look a couple chapters over, Brother Matt, in chapter number 6, and we see they return the ark to Beth Shemesh. Um, what happened is, is they get the ark there rather to uh, Beth Shemesh. And... Um, in chapter number 6, verse 19, it gets kind of serious because it says, And he smote the men in Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000, threescore and ten men, and the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. Here are the Philistines, they start looking inside of this ark, and God just gets in a killing mood. He just starts taking them out, right? I mean, that's a lot of people that he took out there in verse number 19. And the men, of, uh, the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kerjatharim, and saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. They said, We don't want this thing around us no more. <laughs> hey, look, yeah, uh, we, we took it, but y'all can have it back, all right? Uh, come get it. We'll bring it to you. We'll have it post mailed. I don't care. Let's just get this thing out of our presence. All these people over in Beth Shemesh have gone dying on us. And we, we don't, who can stand before this Lord, right? A child of God can. Yeah. Amen. He didn't, well, he did. Because he did something he wasn't supposed to, oh, use a, right? Or as a, however you want to say it. But we can go before the presence of God now through the shed blood of Christ. We have the opportunity to come before God. These people did it, right? They just followed the presence of God, Brother Peter, and he brought them through. Amen. Now we can talk to the very, the very God of heaven. The very one spoke it all into existence, Brother Matt. We can talk to, we can go in his presence anytime we want to. He's always willing to hear from us, always willing to speak to us. These guys here, these uh, Philistines, they say, hey, we don't want this thing anymore. anymore." So in chapter 7 of 1 Samuel 6, they, they take the ark to the house of Abinadab there in uh, kiriath Jerim, uh, where it stays for about 20 years. This reference in 1 Samuel 14, 18, they bring the ark to the war camp just temporarily. In 1 Samuel 14, 18, the Bible says, And Saul said unto Ahai, Bring hither the ark of God, for the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. Now, why would Saul want the ark at a war camp? Why, why would he want that? Think about all the victories we've talked about. 
If you're going through a battle, wouldn't you want what has been the common thread through all these victories that you've read about, all these victories that you've heard about? Wouldn't you want that very thing with you? If I knew that if I had this book right here with me, every time that I got a victory, wouldn't you want that book with you? That one's not going to do. This one's not going to do. It's a red one. It's not going to do. No, no. That's not going to do. Because this is what it is, right? This is it. Call it superstition, whatever you will. This isn't superstition when you're talking about the Lord. If this book was with me every time that I went into a battle and I come out on the other end of it, I want that book with me every time. So here we see Saul going into a war and he's sitting there at that war camp. He says, go down there and get the ark. Get the ark. He wanted it with them because of the victories that surrounded the ark, which we've already talked about. So, we see that in verse number 18, he said, go down, or chapter 14, verse 18, go down and, and uh, get the ark from the children of Israel. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, 2 Samuel chapter 6, the ark is moved on a cart over to Obed-Edom's house for three months. That's when poor old Uzzah, or Uzzah, whatever his name is, just trying to be a good, good guy, just trying to take care of things, ends up losing his life over it because he tried to steady something and he tried to put his hand on something God told him not to. Now, we've got to make sure that we're being careful that we don't get too comfortable around the presence of God. Now, I understand the Bible says, come boldly to the throne. I understand that. But God is not a genie in a bottle. And a lot of times, whenever we start getting a little cocky in our walk with God, we start thinking, I'll just rub that lamp real quick and he'll come out and he'll fix everything. Now, I'm not saying that where it was, it was but he was just trying to, but God is serious about his presence. God is serious about his holiness. If he tells you not to touch it, Brother Matt, he says he means don't touch it. If he means respect and honor and, and love and, and see him as the supreme authority, that's exactly what he means is to love, respect, and see him as the supreme authority. We're not to walk in as spoilt, spoilt children do and say, you owe me this, you owe me this, you owe me that. And I don't believe we're at a place that that happens in our life. But I'm saying that this evening just for the simple fact of we need to make sure that it never does. He's not a genie in a bottle. He's not just when I want something, I will do it. He's not something we pull out of our pocket and rub and say, all right, God, this is what I need right now. After the ark later in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 through 17, David brings the ark to Jerusalem and sets the ark in the tent that is set up for it. David in chapter 15 of 2 Samuel must flee Jerusalem. And as he flees Jerusalem, he says, I want that to come with me, right? That's going to come with me. And he realizes that needs to go back. He ends up sending the ark back. But he wanted the ark with him for the same purpose of which, Brother Mike, we've talked about all night. He wants the very presence of God to stay with him for the victories that he, he needs to win. But he realizes that needs to go back. It goes back uh, to where it, it belongs. Solomon had the temple built in 1 Kings chapter number 8. 1 Kings chapter number 8. The temple's built and we find that the ark was ordered by Solomon to be delivered and placed in the temple, right? Now turn over with me into the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter number 3, and we'll get finished up right here, okay? Jeremiah chapter number 3. In verse number 11, Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 11. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel. Saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. 
that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree and ye have not obeyed my voice saith the Lord turn O backsliding children saith the Lord for I am married unto you and I will take you one of the city and two of the family and I will bring you to Zion and I will give you pastors according to mine heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And this shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind. Neither shall they remember it. Neither shall they visit it. Neither shall that be done any more. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. And all the nations shall be gathered unto it. To the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. He's telling Israel here that his presence will no longer be in that ark. He says that later into the scripture, I think it's verse 16, and he says that uh, he said they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord, they shall it, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they worry about it, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it. He's saying all that because my presence isn't there, it won't be there anymore. He's talking of the church age right here. He's talking about the church age because he said, I will give you pastors according to mine heart. So he's talking about a time here that, that, that his presence will no longer be in an item, but his presence will stay in heaven. And the very presence of God will walk this earth for 33 and a half years. He said they must repent and turn from their adultery. Now these men weren't messing around on their wives. He's talking about the adultery that takes place in, in loving other gods before him. He's married. We're married to God. At salvation we're married to God. And when we start giving the world, Brother Peter, the world a, 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 an opportunity to influence our life, then we are cheating on God, if you will, committing adultery against them. We are the bride, Right? So whenever I'm not living for my bridegroom, the Lord, then what am I doing? I'm cheating. I'm committing adultery. Right? Now we look at it like that, man. Don't it make us feel dirty? Don't it make you feel like a dog? Your pastor too. All right? It makes me feel like a dog. Because that one thing, I can be called a lot of things. But a cheat's not one of them, Brother Matt. I've been faithful to this woman. And I'll continue being faithful to this woman. Maybe it's because nobody else wants me, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. Hey, I'll take the victory away. I can get it, right? But that's my wife. Right? That's my Savior. That's my groom. And one of these days, he's coming back for his bride. And I'm part of that bride. And whenever I start being torn by this world to go and do and be conformed to this world, then ultimately I'm, I'm living in adultery towards Him. Right? Now, if we'll keep that in mind, that'll change the way we do things in our lives. So here He's telling them you must repent. And this is of course of speaking of Christ who would be the very presence of God on earth during, during His time before His ascension back to the throne. There will never be another ark made according to what Jeremiah says here. There will never be another ark made and Christ would be the very presence of God here. Hebrews 9.11 says this, But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That's my Savior. That's my Savior right there. He provided the last blood that God would ever need. No need for the ark anymore because He provided the last blood. No need for somebody to go in and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat anymore because my Savior walked in with that. Where is the ark today? I don't know. I have no idea. 
Some do say that Nebuchadnezzar, when they attacked Jerusalem, they destroyed Jerusalem there in 586 B.C., that they took the ark and they destroyed the ark. Maybe. Maybe that's what happened. I'm just thankful that we don't need it anymore. I'm just thankful that I, I, don't, I don't need that ark anymore. I, I don't need to come to Jerusalem. Don't need to go into the tabernacle. Don't need to go into the temple to see and meet with God. I can meet with God wherever I am. I can meet with Him sitting in my living room. I can meet with Him sitting in my bedroom. I can meet with Him driving down the road. Brother Peter, I've met with Him out on the water before. And when, man, whenever you start looking up and seeing the beauty that God has created around you, and man, you're just motoring out. You can't hear nobody talk to you. All you hear, man, that's a great time to to meet with God. Amen. I'm glad I don't need the ark anymore. Through the blood of Christ, I can come directly to the Father and He hears my petitions. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed tonight. I'm thankful tonight.